um, is n not <coughs> all that helpful translation of the Greek word ap apocalypse. Now you have apocalypse now, apocalypse. Zombie. Calypto is to cover, apocalypto is to uncover. You have eucalyptus trees which are well, the seed is well covered. So apocalypsis is the uncovering of something that's hidden. Something's hidden, it's uncovered. Now keep that picture in mind. <coughs> um, okay, uh, the form, you know, to understand this book, and this is probably of all the books of the Bible, together with the book of Daniel, is the most misinterpreted, abused book. Hence it doesn't come first, it comes last. Before you come to Revelation, Luther says you've got to have um, made sense of all the rest of the scriptures. And then you can make sense of the book of Revelation. Um, okay, um, let's go to chapter 1, verse 1 and 3, where John makes quite clear what he's doing here and what this book is. Let's start off with you, Stephen. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Just stop there. Notice it's the revelation of what? Of Jesus as the Christ. He is the Christ, but he's hidden. Now, what's the problem? If I can just focus there. The problem that we face, that you face, is Jesus is here now. Yes. But what's the problem? You can't see him. You can't see what he's doing. You can't see what he's saying. So, um, this book has to do with the revelation of what's hidden. And basically, it's not about some just future events, but it's, a, it's the person who's revealed. Jesus is revealed. So the focus is on Jesus. Now read that whole introductory section for me. Which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. Now you get a chain here. God sends an angel to John. The angel gives to John the revelation of Jesus Christ. The uncovering of it. Um, John sees the revelation. And then he testifies um, uh, to God's servants. Who are God's servants? Christians. The church. They Servants here in the sense of worshippers. Those who worship God who worship Jesus. And he shows them the word and testimony of Jesus. The word of God, uh, which he sees, and uh, the testimony of Jesus, Jesus' testimony to himself. And this consists of past and present events. What will be uh, happen soon, what will be done Soon, what must soon take place. Notice the word soon. Now this is deliberately chosen because it is not just future events, it is also present events. But the focus is not so much on the future, but on the present. So, um, uh, this is a apocalypse. It's the apocalypse or revelation of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ with visions and words of prophecy. He sees and he hears. Now, um, what John's given is a vision of present and future events in human history in the light of eternity. So, he sees... Uh, uh, present events in the light of eternity and he sees future events in the light of eternity. Um, can we have a look at those two passages please uh, uh, Stephen? Chapter 1 verse, what's it, verse 9 
I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So the vision comes to John, who's imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, um, and he's there because of uh, the word of God, the testimony of Jesus. Now, what is it that he has a vision of? Chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. I don't, what must take place after this, which is the opening of heaven? which must take place from now on. Present, future. So it's not just future, it's also present. Now, and um, the important thing now, can I give you a hermeneutical key to understanding John? Um, number one, John is basically a visionary prophet, therefore he sees the Word of God. And you've got to use your imagination. And uh, again and again, first of all, John sees and then he, he hears. What he hears interprets what he sees. And you need to interpret what John sees in the light of what John hears. Those two things. So, vision and word together. You I get that pattern? I looked and I saw, and then he says, and I heard. Now, of that, which are the most important? What he sees or what he hears? Sees. No, not what he sees. What he hears is the important thing. Um, he, uh, that interprets what he hears. And he writes this as a letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, the seven congregations that he was a bishop over. That's present-day Turkey. Now, what are the circumstances of this letter? Can you attend, please? Uh, which verse? No, see, you're not listening. Yeah. I'm not even talking to you. <laughs> uh, I just want your attention. <laughs> Once again, Dylan. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, he's blaming you. Now, what are the circumstances of the letter? Uh, John was in exile on the island of Patmos during the persecution of Domitian round about 95 AD. This makes this one of the last books, probably the last book of the New Testament. 95 AD? It's very late. Um, now, what had happened under Domitian, you may remember from church history, was that Domitian decided that uh, uh, the empire was disintegrating politically, and therefore they needed some common religious cement to bring unity to a Un disunited empire. And he did this by uh, establishing an emperor cult, which meant the practicalities of that was that once every year, um, if you wanted to have a certificate to d trade and to be involved in public life, you had to go to a statue of Domitian somewhere in some place, and you had to take a pinch of incense and put it on the altar before the statue of Domitian, and you had to bow down before the statue and say, my Lord and my God. Dominus et Deus. My Lord and my God. They were the two Latin words that were used. Now, Christians refused to do that, quite obviously. Um, now, um, do you remember, you probably know from a lot of uh, uh, popular literature, the number 666. Yep. Okay, 666 is nothing mysterious. Uh, letters and numbers are the same thing in the ancient world. If you add this together, um, um, no, behind that lies... The name Nero. <laughs> um, who was the first persecutor of the church. Uh, but the reference to the number there is referring to the certificate that you received if you acknowledged um, the emperor, you had the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast was a certificate that you had that allowed you to uh, engage in public life. 
Yeah. What? That prophecy is fulfilled. Yep, that's fulfilled. Don't worry about it. Now, he's commanded by the angel to write the contents of his visions then to the seven churches of Asia Minor that were under his care. He was the bishop of this church. Now, his purpose is quite simple. He wants to encourage these congregations, these Christians, to resist the demands for emperor worship, not to submit, no matter what the cost, and then to encourage them to be, remain faithful to Christ in the face of persecution. Now, can you put yourself in the shoes of these tiny little outposts of Christianity? Uh, the empire, with all its resources, is determined to crush you. Um, how would you feel? Well, pretty scared. You'd feel pretty scared and you'd be worried about the future. Um, how, what, would, what thoughts would you come into your mind? Because Jesus is supposed to be what? Love. He's supposed to be all-powerful. He is king. He is king of heaven and earth. All authority in heaven and earth is given to Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the ruler over all nations. You look around and who seems to be king? The emperor. And his power is evil power, demonic power. And notice this, so there's a contradiction between your faith what you believe, which is that Jesus is Lord, is contradicted by the claim that Domitian is Lord. And if you go follow experience, if you look at reality, uh, who's Lord? The Emperor. The Emperor. It's quite obvious. And he can, now he can uh, put you to death. He can put you to death. Uh, he has the power of life and death over you. Now, what John says that yes, the emperor may have the power of physical life and death, but somebody else holds the real keys of life and death. Who's next? Yeah. Uh, okay, Levi now. Um, the prophecies begin with a, the John having a vision of the risen Lord Jesus. Levi, can you read from verse 12? Um, uh, through to verse 19 of chapter 1. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one, like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with the golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and in his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death, of the Hades and of death. Verse 19-2. Write the things which you have seen and the things, which you have, and the things that which will take place after this. Notice the double references there. What you've seen, what's now and what will take place later. Jesus has the keys of life and death. Not physical life and death, but eternal life and eternal death. He has the power of the keys. David. Um, can I be excused? Well, sorry, just... You go. Thank you. Now, um, this, if you're going to make sense of this book, you need to understand its structure and the way it works. Now, one of the big problems with interpretation is that people see this as if it's uh, in linear terms. To use a picture I had before, that you have a vision of 
which you have a chronological sequence. First this, then that, then that, then that, then this. Yeah, that's right. right uh, that you get, a, if you like, a film that which gives you scenes in chronological order. Now, if you go that way, you're going to end up with the fairies. And you're going to go in trouble. Because um, uh, uh, this book is constructed around a series of sevens, and the way it is, if you like, it's not so much a telling, a, you know, giving a whole film with a story, but you get a number of snapshots, little scenes, montages. And what happens then is, instead of being a linear, it's kind of circular, it's spiralling. You have each section begins with one place, let's say it here, and it focuses on the same thing. And you get seven episodes spiral. Okay? And it's all focused on one and the same thing. The same thing seen from this angle, that angle, this angle, this angle. It's, it's like if instead of, instead of uh, uh, walking th along a story, a road, what you're doing is walking around something to look at it. So Get the basic picture? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's not four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's one bad thing, and there's four different interpretations that look like horsemen, and three interpretations that look like something else. No. Okay. You're going to some detail there, which is I, I haven't got time to go into. Right. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not going around the same circle all the time, because what you're getting is a kind of a spiral. You have this, and then you have another angle. You go, you know, you have it this, and then you go this, and then you go this, and finally you go outside of the thing, and you go into the centre. Now, with the, uh, what we spoke about eternity, uh, uh, you need to bear in mind as we go through the book this way. And you can see how we have sevens here that are going to happen. Um, the structure of the book, okay? Now, just look at the way it goes. First of all, you get an introduction uh, to the letter. And then you get the first word of God spoken to John. Dylan, please read 1 verse 8. There's only two times God speaks directly to John. This is the first word of God to John. And everything in the letter is exegesis of this one word. So uh, 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 this is emphatic. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Don't, I am Alpha and Omega, that's the first and last letter of the Greek, Greek alphabet. Who is and was and is to come is a exegesis of the holy name Yahweh, the one who is or the one who was or the one who is to be. All possible, Yahweh. He is the uh, Almighty, He is the ruler over the cosmos. So you get the first word of God there. And then you get seven cycles of visions. Now why seven? Because seven is the holy number. Seven is the number of completion. So you have seven visions and within these sev seven, seven visions or seven scenes you have sevens. So it begins uh, with a picture of, okay, what's the focus? The first focus is the church in the world. So it starts off with the church and the world. And the church and the world is not one single thing, but it consists for, for uh, John of seven congregations in Asia Minor. Uh, and so you get, uh, you get the introduction of this, the risen Lord Jesus, who's present in the candlestick. Wow. You have the menorah, you remember in the, holy of ho uh, in the holy place you have the holy lamp and that lamp had seven, lampstand had seven lamps. Now you get a, a funny picture here. John knows, his people know that that lampstand is in heaven. Okay, but John sees that Jesus is 
the lampstand, and guess what the seven lamps are? Seven the seven congregations. So Jesus is present in the seven churches. So Jesus present in the persecuted congregation. So he's the vision of the risen Lord who's present in the seven churches and then you get the seven letters to the seven churches in the light of the fact that Jesus is there with them that they are held in the hands of Jesus they are each one is a separate lamp in the heavenly lampstand now notice then just taking that together John's vision brings two things together in his vision heaven and earth overlap. Can you see that? Heaven and earth overlap. Those congregations are on earth and yet they are in heaven at the same time. And what are the seven golden lampstands then? They're not lampstands, they're the seven lamps. So you have one lampstand and then you have seven lamps. And those seven lamps are seven stars. They are... It's, yes? But in, yeah, so in 2 1 it says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. It shouldn't be lampstands, it's the lamp holders. There's seven of them. Yeah. So you get the lampstand, and then you get the arms, and then on them you have lamps. You have seven lamps. Okay, so it's, just the other it's the seven arms of the lamp. <laughs> okay, the second scene is. Um, the focus is still here on, on the church and uh, what we have is a vision of the suffering church um, and uh, uh, it begins with the uh, presentation of a scroll to God who sits on the throne and there's nobody who can open the scroll the scroll is God's plan God's purpose for the world and that scroll is given to Jesus Jesus opens the seven seals of the scroll and by doing so, he implements God's plan for the whole world. So what's God's purpose for the world? Jesus carries out God's kingdom. He establishes God's kingdom. He opens the seven seals. And so you have the opening of the seven seals. And at the end of the opening of the seventh seal, you get to the next scene in which the focus is not on the church that suffering together with Jesus the Lamb but the focus is on the fate of the world okay what does this mean what does it mean for the world that Jesus the Lamb reigns in the church you get an introduction in which uh, uh, the prayers of the church are compared to incense that's brought before God and that incense is thrown all over the world. The saints reign together with God. They, on the one hand, they have a harp or a lyre in praise. On the other hand, they have a bowl of incense. And it's the prayers of the church that determine the fate of the world. It's by praying for the world that the church shapes the destiny of the world. And then you get... Um, uh, in response to the prayers of the church, you get the seven trumpets which announce the seven uh, acts of God in human history. Seven acts of judgment. Um, and then you get the um, central scene. Notice you have seven. What you need to have is first and last is important and the central one. What is the central drama of human history? It's not the battle between Caesar and the church. It's not the battle between Gentiles and Jews, unbelievers and believers. The central battle is between Christ and Satan. That's the heart of the drama. And you have a vision then of the opening of heaven and the casting of Satan from heaven to earth. So Satan no longer has a place before God to accuse and condemn the faithful people of God. The only foothold he has in the cosmos is on planet Earth. And his target now is no longer God, but the tar his target is the church. He attacks the church because he cannot attack Jesus, the Lord of uh, the cosmos. Are we in the 
period now? Yes, this is, well, you see, this is not different periods. It's all one, it's the period after the ascension of Jesus and the end of the world. This is the drama that's going on. Yes, it's yes. at the ascension of Jesus, Satan and his angels were cast from God's presence so they can no longer accuse us before God. So where do they accuse us? Not before God, but they accuse us on earth here. They can't attack Jesus, so they attack the body of Jesus, the church. Yes? Doesn't that make things more difficult for us? It does, yeah. <laughs> But we're in the forefront of the battle. And you better get used to that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jesus, when he was in his three year earthly ministry here, he said that he saw Satan fall like lightning. Yes. So, had that already happened? No, don't, don't, don't look at because we're thinking in, not in, 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 in temporal, you're thinking in temporal terms. This is eternal. Jesus sees Satan falling from lightning from heaven. Um, when he sent out the 70 evangelists and they preached the gospel, um, they cast out demons, even the demons submitted to the 70 evangelists in his name. They come back rejoicing and Jesus says, I saw Satan falling as lightning from heaven. Now, the falling of lightning from heaven, the, the eviction of Satan from heaven begins with the... When? It begins with the baptism of Jesus and it culminates in the ascension of Jesus. So, if you like, that event, the ministry of Jesus, as a single ministry of Jesus, beginning with his baptism, culminating in his ascension, is the casting out of Satan. It's the exorcism of Satan from God's presence, if I can put it that way. We've talked the human church Yes. This is this is eternal time, if I can put it that way. It's so difficult. Hence, I'm saying this. Think in terms of. Can you see here? You're not dealing with different things. Where do you start off? Seven congregations, and then you get the heavenly assembly of the church. Then you get the world, the church in the world. Not a different thing. It's still looking at the same thing. Now you get the secret battle that's going on between good and evil. And we're still looking at the one same thing. We're, we're looking at the one and same thing from different angles, in different okay. dimensions. Yeah. If you can say, another way of looking at it is you have different dimensions of the same reality. Ooh. Which has to do with the reign of Jesus. No. Um, <laughs> Sounds like planes. No, because it's, it's not planes, because it's all very earthly. You, it's not a, the, the, the problem with the analogy of the spiral is that you seem to be getting up higher and higher, whereas in some extent you're getting here lower and lower. No, deeper, digging deeper and deeper into the mystery. Um, the next scene uh, has to do with the judgment of the world you get the release of God's wrath from the heavenly sanctuary. So from heaven, God's wrath is unleashed, and then in the form of seven bowls that contain the wrath of God, and those bowls throw out God's wrath in the form of seven plagues on the earth. God's judgment on the wicked. The next scene has to do with not the world, but the center of opposition to God in the world, which is the city of Rome, which is called Babylon. And Babylon is compared to, instead of a mother Rome, you have the prostitute Rome. Um, so it begins with the offer of the angel to show John the red prostitute. And who is the red prostitute? The red prostitute is is Rome. Rome. Um, the bride of Christ is the church. The counterpart to that is Rome. The city of Rome, the anti-God city. And then you get the seven words of judgment of God on Babylon, namely Rome, Roman Empire, and all anti-God cities. So it's not just, notice the city, this is not just uh, Rome, it's called Babylon because it's every anti-God city. Um, so you can include in that, you know, 
uh, Soviet Union or Washington or Canberra. Yes. No. But saying that, in that sense, is how do we interpret it then in the sense of cities are now so diverse? Well, cities even back then were so diverse. They were diverse. We were inhabited them. So, and but, I mean, but you get the concentration of evil in certain places. But I mean, even while this was being read, yes. like Clement or whatever was yes. writing about yes. how good the church was now in Rome, that the first lot of persecution had been over and done with. And like, that was a bit later. Well, it was yes, a little bit later, later, but yes, yeah. yes, yes. But um, yeah, and that's the problem of interpretation of this because so much good there as well. That's the right. Uh, notice, there's no condemnation of Rome. The condemnation is of the what? prostitutes. The prostitute, they're saying the prostitute is Rome. Oh. Okay, you, that's part of your uh, growing, stretching, yes. So since this is not a, a temporal thing, but yes. looking at, and so these principles continue to apply in this right. cosmic battle, and so yes. 666 there, while meaning Nero, will also represent anyone who demands Christians worship. That's right. And it's Domitian, it's, anyone who it's Stalin, it's Pol Pot, it's Hitler, it's all those that, all human beings who... Uh, claim to uh, take Christ's place, yeah. who uh, claim divine worship, who, cl who set themselves up as God. And that doesn't just happen once in human history, it's the recurring story of human history. Politicians, in order to unify and retain their power, can't do it just with military power or legal power. Cultural power, they have to have spiritual power. And that's when they get into trouble, yes. So this 666 is Nero persona is different then from the Antichrist because the Antichrist comes from through the church. Yes. Yes. So there's two different things. They're two different things. Okay. At least that's the way I take it. There's a lot of mystery here and, and uh, can you see that interpretation of this is not going to be easy and you need a lot of uh, maturity. Uh, then comes the seventh uh, scene which has to do with the goal of world history. So you see, now what is all this leading to? What's the uh, goal of all the, uh, what happens previously? And it begins then, and this is the second one, this is the second opening of heaven. Before you had the opening of heaven, now you get the second opening of heaven. Um, you have the opening of heaven and you have seven visions about the final victory of the Lamb over all evil powers. So the victory of the Lamb. Now there's a paradox. The Lamb that was slain is the victor. Uh, the Lamb is the lion, or the lion is the Lamb. That's the central paradox. And those seven visions of final victory culminate in the last words of God to John. Now there's two places in which God speaks to John. Notice this second one, very important. Who's next? Me. Mm, you. Can you read chapter 21, 5 to 8? And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Just stop there. He repeats what was said at the beginning. He's the Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end. But now you get the new thing. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And that's the final word of God. Um, the one who's seated on the throne, the word.